I joined in early 1996 and at that stage with the exception of Somalia, Rwanda and, and, a, and a few other smaller deployments, the Australian Army really hadn't done much since the Vietnam War. Um, so as, as far as I was concerned, I was joining an army which probably wasn't going to go anywhere uh, anytime soon. I started as a, as a rifleman, so I started at the 6th Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, um, and I'd seen that uh, and, I'd, and I'd, I'd done a lot of work as a, as, a, as a rifleman. And when I went to Duntroon, I thought I'd like to continue doing that sort of work, but I thought actually cavalry being, having a mounted and dismounted role would probably give me more opportunities for deployment. And it really sort of f was a good fit for the way that I sort of saw the world. It, it, Cavalry at the time using light armoured vehicles could do anything from um, peacekeeping and security operations all the way through to sort of you know, limited offensive and, and defensive operations. So it, it, it really covered, covered everything that I, you could possibly conceive was going to happen in the next few years. As a young troop leader, I went to Iraq in uh, 2004. Our role was uh, as a security detachment, so we were responsible for the protection of the diplomatic staff, the Australian diplomatic staff in Baghdad. Um, but, but I guess subtly as well, we were there to allow them to carry out their diplomatic function as well. So it wasn't just protection in their embassy, it was getting them out and around um, Baghdad so they, could, so they could do their diplomatic function um, on behalf of Australia. And I guess that's where I came into it because I was commanding the cavalry troop. Uh, so I had three patrols. Um, and they were escorting diplomatic staff th throughout the city uh, on, a, on a daily basis. From an, an Australian operations perspective, it was busy. So we had, like I said, I had three patrols, two of which were out on the street at any one time, and one was my, my quick reaction force. So I could deploy either to, to cover a new task that came up, or more importantly, to go and support one of the patrols if they, if they got themselves in trouble, whether that's a vehicle breakdown through to an enemy contact. Um, so we were very busy. We would do anything up to 15, 20 tasks a day uh, throughout throughout Baghdad. Um, and, and Baghdad's a big sprawling city, so there was a lot of time on the road. Um, from a enemy perspective, uh, it was very busy. So the insurgents, and at that time they, they, they talk about them being up to anything up to 40,000 active insurgents at Iraq at the time. Um, so we had on any given day, there were multiple IED, improvised explosive device attacks throughout the city, ranging from roadside bombs to uh, what they call tro trolling suicide IEDs. So uh, an individual in a car with a bomb in the back looking for soft targets, either Iraqi security forces or coalition forces that they would drive their vehicle into and then, and then detonate the, the, the explosive payload. Um, mixed in with, with small arms attacks, uh, rocket attacks, um, and then overlaid over the top, just a normal churn of a, of a big city, of a city with, with millions of people um, living and working in it. Whilst a lot of my role was coordination of those three patrols uh, and dealing with, with tasks which would pop up at very short notice, um, I would also make sure that I would get out on the road at least once a day. Didn't always happen, um, but I would always try and get out there just so I could understand what, what the, how the guys were operating, um, but also just to, to, to get a feel of the environment and make sure I stayed on top of what I was asking them to do as well. Actually, you know, showing a bit of um, face and I wasn't just gonna be the officer stuck behind a desk, um, you know, talking on a radio. Um, so I, I had, and again, it was the Charlie Patrol again, I'd, I'd actually, I told the crew commander that I'd take his first job of the morning. Um, so, and yeah, that, that patrol, um, we, we got targeted by a, a roadside um, a bomb as we, as we passed, heading, we're heading north into the, into the international zone. And uh, that went off just within five metres of, of, of my vehicle as we passed. We were travelling about 60 kilometres an hour when, when the bomb went off, and so we actually careered across the road and, and hit a tree in the medium strip, quite a sizable tree, which um, was uprooted, but luckily stopped our vehicle as well. So reasonable blasts go off, and then we had a, a pretty reasonable traffic accident as well um, 
thrown in on top of that. Uh, so my, my recollections post-blast were actually coming to down in the bottom of the turret. Um, I'd never been much of a sportsman and I, and I hadn't really been knocked out before and I, I came to thinking, you know, what the, what the hell has been going on here? Um, didn't quite know where I was, um, couldn't breathe, couldn't see, and my legs were, were really hurting. Um, it took me a second and I can't, I, I'm not quite sure the sequence that had happened, but I, I prized my eyes open and they were, um, my face was quite badly burned and I had a lot of blood over my, over my eyes, but I prized them open and worked out that I could see. Um, I, after a few attempts to, to breathe, let out a, a bit of a whimper and started sort of breathing quite painfully, but, but started breathing um, again after that. And then managed to pull myself up and, and and sit myself on the the ammunition bin in the center of the turret and uh and probably at that stage i i well firstly i realized that the pain in my legs was because i just dropped on my legs in the in the turret and you know, it's a big metal turret there's no soft edges in an armored vehicle and it's um uh and i you know they twisted up underneath me but uh but really once i was sitting on that ammunition bin it was when i started to sort of think relatively um coherently at that stage I had fragmentation wounds in my neck, um, and that had that had nicked the artery there, and I had a had quite an enormous, quite a, it was a grapefruit-sized hematoma, to swell within a, a couple of minutes of the blast. So, um, and, and the other thing is, I had fragmentation in here, in in the bridge of my nose and, and my eyebrow, um, and so they was just sort of mopping the blood up with that, um, but uh, they. They loaded me into the vehicle, got me to hospital. So I was, I was at the coalition support hospital within about 15 minutes. And um, I was still talking and somewhat coherent at that stage. And uh, they basically took me out, rolled me straight into to theatre from there to operate on my neck because I was really worried that was going to cut off the blood supply to my brain. First bit of surgery, 36 hours there until they, they determined I was at a point where I was okay to travel. So um, they, they strapped me to a stretcher and put me on a, on a helicopter and flew me up to Balad, which is about 100 kilometres north of, of Baghdad. Um, and that was the big logistics supply base and main, main um, medical treatment facility uh, for Iraq. Everything would sort of come in and go out of Balad. I, I was there only only a short time um, they they took me off um, I went into to a triage tent they determined that I was okay to uh, to travel um, to Germany from there so they loaded me on an, um, a, a transport aircraft from there and flew me to Germany so I was injured in late October 25th of October I think March the next year I was signed off as fully fit um, so yeah What's that? Five months. Um, but I'm very lucky that it was, you know, here down was 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 good, and everything else, you know, recovered fairly quickly. I was back in Baghdad 18 months later, so I'd uh, I'd stepped up a rank, stepped up a level of seniority, and I went back as the security detachment second in command. So it was a 110 man team that I was really the. the operations officer for. Um, Baghdad had changed. It had gone from 2004 as a functioning capital city to a city which was, was under siege, basically. Um, insurgent attacks had stepped up. Um, so it, was quite a, it had quite a different feel to it. It was a lot more concrete tea walls um, fencing off big, big chunks of the city. Whereas back in 2004, it had, it had a much more of a functional feel to it. Um, in 2006, people were just just surviving. Um, the security detachment itself functioned in a very different way. So it had gone from having, you know, Australian patrols out on the street all day, every day, to any time we we went out into what they call the red zone. So anything outside the international zone was a deliberate planned operation.
So we would sit down to a deliberate planning session, come up with a range of contingency plans for any sort of thing that might eventuate during that operation. Completely the opposite of the way we'd worked uh, back in 2004. It was, a, it was quite an incredible deployment. Um, it, was, it was personally, professionally, um, extremely hard, but also extremely rewarding. I don't know sound crass, but it, I did find it professionally extremely rewarding. The three, there were three events that took place during that, that deployment, which will always stand out in my mind. Um, the first was Jake Kovko, um, dying from, from accidentally shooting himself with his pistol. Um, and then the, the, the media storm, all, all the other things that occurred um, as part of, of, part of that, that incident. Um, secondly, we had, a, we had a, one of our patrols engage a, a vehicle that was behaving like a, like a suicide um, uh, vehicle. Uh, and it turned out that it wasn't. Um, so it had been security guards which had run a checkpoint and swerved, tried to swerve in between some of our vehicles, so behaving erratically in exactly the same sort of tactics that, 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 that those trolling suicide vehicle born IEDs use. Um, and, and they were engaged and it killed, killed one of the occupants of the vehicle and, and severely injured uh, another three. And then the third was, a, was an early morning rocket strike at the, at the compound. Now I was actually in it in at um, Camp Victory in our national headquarters when that occurred um, and I immediately commandeered a seat on a helicopter back into, into Baghdad to help manage that situation. But we had, um, we had five people wounded from that rocket strike. So it was a, um, a rocket fired from the north uh, east from Sadar City down into, into the international and just happened probably aiming for, for the construction of the new US Embassy which was happening across the road from where our, our base was. Um, I think two, three rockets were fired, two went long and landed in the Tigris, one fell short and hit our compound. Um, we had, I said, five people injured. One female corporal was, was quite badly injured but she has since recovered from her, her injuries. Um, so they're the, they're the three things that, that stand out um, for me um, from that from that deployment. But uh, as far as being a young captain, uh, I don't think there's you don't get opportunities like that being thrown in the thrown in the hot seat uh, very often in your life. Getting close to a to a bomb does funny things to you, um, and and one of those things for me was a a deep interest in the insurgent improvised explosive device technology and, and tactics. Um, so after, after coming back from my, my second trip to Iraq, where we, we'd seen in that second trip how those, those, that technology had evolved. You know, they were using you know, current communications devices to trigger the bombs. They were using um, things like in, infrared um, triggers um, to, to target vehicles as they passed. Um, it was really quite amazing, but also extremely challenging from a from a Australian military perspective of, of having our own technology to counter um, the insurgent um, tactics and, and and equipment. So I made a nuisance of myself to all the right people and got posted to the the counter ID task force down in Canberra, which was looking specifically at the uh, at at the global ID threat, but because we had troops in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was it, our main focus was Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so we looked at, uh, I, I assisted in the, the procurement of, of you know, current generation radio jammers. Um, I, I helped with the development of um, uh, tactics, techniques and procedures, TTPs, um, around working as safely as you could in, a, in an IED environment, IED threat environment. Um, I engaged um, with, with coalition partners quite regularly um, to ensure we were all up to date with, with current um, enemy tactics, but also friendly, friendly TTPs. 
Um, but most importantly out of that is I got involved in the intelligence space as well. So I looked at some of the intelligence work which was happening around the country, uh, around the world um, by coalition partners and by Australia um, to target insurgent bomb makers and supply chains, which, which led to my, to my deployment to Afghanistan. So I went leading a, a small four-man team into Afghanistan, into Aruzgan province. Um, it's called a weapons intelligence team. So our function was to um, collect um, evidence on, on IED strikes, on, on IED fines, um, for two main reasons. One, to feed into the intelligence community so we can learn more about insurgent bomb makers and supply chains so they can be, they can be targeted, um, but also so we could understand the, the, the bombs being used against uh, us and so we could, again, assist commanders in developing those, those um, ways of operating so they could, they could minimise the, the chance of getting hit. So the weapons intelligence team was a um, was just pulled together for the deployment. It's not a standing uh, military organisation. Uh, so my team came together for the deployment and then disbanded after the deployment. Um, I went back into normal mainstream military postings at that stage. So I I came back. I was very lucky. I went to what they call the combat training centre, um, which trains. Uh, groups about to go to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I got to take all my knowledge um, and feed it into developing training for, for teams about to go overseas. So extremely rewarding position to go into from, from just coming back from deployment. Uh, I then uh, moved on from that to be, uh, again, went up another rank, went up another level of seniority and, and commanded a, a an ASLAV squadron back at my old regiment, so back at the 2nd Cavalry Regiment, my old, my old, it was A squadron, my old squadron. Um, again, very rewarding role. And that, uh, that saw me to the end of my time in the, in the regular army. I had a young wife, young family, um, and I had been away a lot. So it was probably time to take, make, make a bit of a change, spend some more time at home. I don't march on Anzac Day. Um, I'm, I'm usually involved in some way on Anzac Day. Um, I think like a lot of people, there are aspects of Anzac Day which work for me and aspects of Anzac Day which I don't necessarily identify with. I'm in my early 40s. I don't identify with marching on Anzac Day. Uh, that's... That's not saying that there aren't a lot of people my age and younger who do identify with marching on Anzac Day, and they do that. Um, it's not my thing. I, I was never into regimental parades when I was in the military. There's some people that love them. I mean, it, it, so, so I, you know, I, I always, when people say, oh, Anzac Day, what's, what's it all mean to you? What's it all about? And I think, well, it's all about freedom. And part of that freedom is to celebrate the day any way you, or commemorate the day any way you see fit. Um, and so I wholeheartedly support those veterans that want to go march. And there's no saying that when I'm, when I'm a few years older, I might think that that's the right thing for me to be doing. Um, more so, I, I much prefer, and I've been very lucky over the last few years, I've been asked to speak at, at Anzac Day services. Um, and I'm, I feel very strongly about that, that it's great to have military representation, people being able to tell recent stories of what the Australian military has done in Australia's name um, so the rest of society has a better understanding of that.